We welcome you into the Jax USL Report. We are without Mauricio Ruiz this week, who's been traveling. We'll uh, have Mauricio back in his normal spot coming up next week. But I think we've done pretty well to bring up our bit strong bench here. And uh, we're joined this week by the three-time national championship winning coach, Becky Burley, who, of course, was a part of our launch for the USL Super League team. Becky, uh, great to have you here as part of the Jax USL Report. Always great to talk to you. Hey, I feel uh, I feel like I'm coming strong off the bench. Mauricio's a good starter, but I'm I'm coming strong off the bench. It's like Rose Lavelle coming off the bench here and making a difference for yeah. the U.S. Uh, we like that. All right, let's talk a little bit about the U.S. We'll, we'll get into some of the uh, uh, USL championship, but Women's World Cup obviously dominating the headlines right now in the soccer world. What's been your big takeaway from what's happened so far in the Women's World Cup for the U.S.? Well, you know, I'm just going to say an overall takeaway in the World Cup for me is I have loved this World Cup because it is just showing us the depth of teams across the world and how quickly teams are are catching up and putting resources towards uh, the teams. And it's been so fun to watch. And for the U.S., you know, like U.S. is in a tough spot because nothing less than perfection is what people ex expect. But to be fair, um, you know, I think they've done some really good things and, and they still have a big one. I mean, this this game at 3 a.m. is going to be the death of me. But like that game right there is going to be a really great test because, you know, Portugal is going to be hard to break down for sure. Um, but at the same time, like this is such a great opportunity for the U.S. to play a quality opponent going into the next rounds. There have been so many chances created by the United States in past World Cups. You mentioned, you know, nothing less than perfection. And we expect to see some five or six goal games sometimes, which is probably unreasonable. But the chances have been there. They just haven't been able to convert uh, as they have in some past uh, World Cups. As From a coaching standpoint, do you just expect at some point that those chances are going to turn into goals? Or do you have to try to tweak something as the tournament goes on? You know, I do think that um, no goals have ever been scored for wanting to score more goals <laughs> because like the more pressure you put on yourself, the more difficult that becomes. But I do think the the thing that the U S would be worried about, which they shouldn't be is if they weren't creating chances and they are definitely creating chances. Yeah. Do we need a little more quality in front of the net for sure? But I think the fact that they're creating these chances um, that bodes really well. And I think we're going to, we're going to see that as the tournament progresses. I want to look at this through your coach's eyes. Um, there have been some players who are coming back off injury who the U.S. has tried to uh, be judicious in terms of use of players. And we mentioned Rose Lavelle earlier, certainly has been a difference maker coming off the bench. We saw Megan Rapino in the first game. Uh, from a, a, a player usage standpoint, would you make any adjustments here moving forward? You know, that's such a tough one. Um, you know, Vladko's got a no-win situation on his hands because I think there is the side that you could say, okay, these players, these players need to have more cohesion because that, that starting lineup really has not started together prior to this. And, and we could point the finger to that as like, why not? And there's some factors in that. Um, but I think there's the other part of it is like, man, this is a long tournament and using your depth, which the U S is for sure known for. And it's like something that's some, a point that we need to leverage at some point. Um, but I think that that's, you can, you can kind of make the case on both sides it's a, it's a tough one. I do feel like he's got some quality options off the bench. And I think probably like most U S fans, we'd like to see some of those players get in the game. Um, but I understand why he's making the decisions he's making too. Right, well, let's look at this uh, tournament as a whole. We've seen top 10 teams beaten uh, in the group stage. Uh, I, I, I had, that has to speak to two things to me. Tell me if you agree. One is the difficulty of traveling as far as most of these teams have had to to get to New Zealand and, and Australia and the impact there. But also, you know, it, take teams, you know, 10 to 32 in this tournament, um, the amount of talent and the coaching of those teams seems to be getting better and better year over year. No doubt. I mean, that's been the, that's what's made this World Cup so exciting. I feel I feel like it's been the first more balanced World Cup. Like you don't really see those outlier games. I mean, there have been a few like eye opening scores, but some of those eye opening scores are with like world powers. You know, when you see like Japan, Spain, like who who would have picked that? You know, and especially if you actually watch the game, like who would have picked that? Um, but I think it's it's just a testament to what separates teams and it's it's razor thin in some cases 
Um, the Japan Spain game is certainly a, an example of that. Um, and I think that travel piece that you mentioned is a really good point. And it's not even just getting there. There's been magnificent amounts of travel within the group stage, you know, so certain teams have had much bigger imbalances in terms of how they've had to travel in between games. And, and that, that's not easy. A, a travel day is like a, a full work day, you know, like that is, that's a heavy load and trying to recover in a short period of time. is not easy. Yeah, it has certainly been a factor. We've seen that so far uh, throughout the course of the, the group stages. Aside from the United States, let's leave the United States out of the conversation for now. What teams are you seeing that you think have a chance to win this tournament? Wow. You know, it's like so up in the air, like uh, Spain would have for sure been one of my ones that I would have said right off the top. And then you see that result. But I, I mean, again, it, the game and the result are two different things. Um, clearly, Japan made a statement with the performance that they put in. Um, the Netherlands, I think, has been, I, for me, a little bit of a surprise in a positive way, because not having Miedema, I thought was going to have a much bigger effect on them. Um, and I just think that there are some like wild cards out there, like the way Australia played today was pretty impressive. I mean, that was a team that was playing in front of a home crowd and really wanting to move on. And boy, did they put a punctuation mark on that one. So it's a it's an unpredictable World Cup, to say the least. Well, let's get back to the topic about the United States in particular going forward. This seems to be a bit of a, a changing of the guard uh, World Cup. You've got uh, some veterans who have been around, have been through you know, three World Cups and, and have been some of the stars for the United States, probably playing in their last World Cups. And you have some young players who are trying to start establishing themselves as the, as the key players for the future. Who's really stood out from that standpoint as far as the young players for the United States? Well, for sure, one of my favorites is Naomi Gurma. And, you know, the fact that you don't really have to talk a lot about her says a lot because what she does is just her job and she takes care of business and she's preventing things before they become like spectacular needs for her to, you know, block shots and things like that. Um, but for, you know, there's just so many great options. I mean, you look at Rodman and you think about like, man, would you want to match up with her for 90 minutes? I mean, that's a handful. You know, you look at even players who haven't played yet, like Alana Cook is a player who really impressed me in the lead up to the World Cup. I think she's someone who's part of the future for sure. Um, and and then you at the same time, you have these veterans who bring so much savvy. And, you know, you look at Julie Ertz, who you're kind of thinking, what what is she going to do in this World Cup? Then she's playing in a different position and she's still playing at the high level she is after not having had a lot of club matches under her belt. I mean, it's it's been pretty impressive to see what this team has done so far. Again, it all goes back to the depth for sure. Um, all right, let's step away from the Women's World Cup conversation. I do want to talk about uh, your role with and what's happened with Jack USL. And I'm wondering what kind of feedback you have gotten from uh, folks in your network and around the soccer world since uh, it was announced that you were becoming a part of uh, what's happening here in Jacksonville? Well, I, I don't know if they're as excited about me being involved as much as having pro soccer in Jacksonville. I mean, I think that's been just the word on the street is like, wow, like how cool is that? Especially with the amount of really, really good players that have come out of this area and to now have a place where they can continue their careers at that level. That's That's been the buzz for sure. Um, but I think also, you know, being involved with it for me, I feel like it's a it's an honor to be a part of a group that's really serious about taking women's soccer and men's soccer to the next level. But to have the first ever professional women's team in Jacksonville, um, along with, you know, the first female mayor of Jacksonville, it just feels like this perfect timing of things coming together. Well, Becky, thanks so much. We uh, appreciate you jumping in here for Mauricio. We'll give Mauricio the job back, but he's on notice now. We know that going forward. Hey, tell him I'm pushing him for time. I'm pushing him for time. <laughs> Absolutely. Becky, thanks so much. Thank you. Becky, thank you so much. We'll get uh, more from you coming up, uh, not only here and also down the road as we uh, continue to tap into her expertise. But let's now take a look at Mauricio's Corner. Without Mauricio this week, he'll be back next week. But we do have some things to take a look at, including a big week of goals in the USL Championship. There were four teams that scored four goals or more over the last week, including Sacramento Republic last Wednesday, a 4-0 victory over Phoenix Rising. They uh, continue to lead the goal differential in the league does uh, Sacramento Republic, plus 21. But oh, hot on their heels, another team we'll get to in just a moment. 
Pittsburgh Riverhounds, a 4-2 win over Memphis, 9-1 on Saturday. Pittsburgh rebounding from back-to-back -back losses. Memphis now winless since uh, the month of July began. They have not won in the month of July. And two Texas teams put up five spots. Rio Grande Valley, 5-2 win over El Paso Locomotive. El Paso's last win, you have to go all the way back to June the 14th after they were red hot to that point. Rio Grande Valley, two wins and two draws in their last five. And San Antonio FC, a 5-2 win over Hartford Athletic. San Antonio trailing only Sacramento in the league with a plus 18 goal differential. That could be key as it comes down the stretch for playoff positioning. All right, let's take a look at the standings right now, starting with the west of the USL Championship, where Sacramento Republic holds on to the top spot. They have a four-point lead on San Antonio. But Oakland Roots right there as well. They're unbeaten in their last five. San Diego Loyal on 33 points have won three straight. It is getting very interesting out west. In the east, Pittsburgh Riverhounds continue to hold the top spot, although Charleston Battery trying to climb their way back in. Battery unbeaten in their last five, just two points back. And the Tampa Bay Rowdies in at third. At the bottom of the table there in terms of the playoff positioning, take a look at Indy 11. They have just one win in their last five, so they are clinging to that eighth and final playoff spot with Detroit City FC and Miami FC nipping right at their heels. It is going to be quite a finish in the USL Championship as the playoffs approach. No Mauricio's corner breakdown as far as the tactical breakdown is concerned this week. We'll get it again when Mauricio returns, but we do want to look ahead to our Game of the week presented by Gotsport. It is going to be a good one with Tulsa FC and Louisville FC going at it next week. Uh, that is Friday night in Oklahoma, and uh, we will have a full breakdown from Mauricio next week right here on the Jacks USL Report. Remember, you can reserve your season tickets for both the Jacks USL USL Championship team as well as the Super League by going to jacksusl.com. $25 reserves your spot as a season ticket owner for both teams moving forward. All right, we want to thank Becky Burley for joining us, as well as thanking you for joining us. We'll be back next week with more, including Mauricio's return, right here on the Jack's USL Report.